Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us and welcome to our webinar today focusing on creating woodland. Firstly, my introduction, I'm Tim Lydon, Till Hills Forestry Director. It's my pleasure to be your host today. The webinar is entitled Creating Woodlands for Cash, Carbon and Conservation. But what does that really mean? We will be looking at how landowners in Scotland can generate an income from planting trees on their land and what it is a reality mean, sorry, what this really means as a reality. We will walk you through our real life case studies from a landowner and client perspective to highlight the many benefits that can be gained from owning trees, from grants and carbon credits through to timber income, while significantly contributing to tackling climate change and enhancing biodiversity. Our first speaker, Callum Murray, will take you to, on a visit to look at a site that on the face of it looks like decent farmland, but in reality was a struggle to make a profit due to the soil types. Planting trees was a good solution and we can show you the considerations that were taken and the benefits of having professional guide you through. Callum has spent 25 years of his career as a forest manager and now has the leading role in developing the services Till Hill can offer in North Scotland for both existing and new clients in need of expert management or landowners with exciting new woodland creation projects of any scale. Callum will offer his professional advice to anyone who is looking to release the full potential of their woodland, farm or land holding. Our second speaker is Andrew Vaughan. Andrew will bring you an interview from one of our landowning clients and discuss with them the process that they went through to create a forest. Their farm consisted of a mix of steep hill ground grazing with quality lower down the hill. We will show you the importance of understanding the client's objectives and shaping an appropriate plan, the costs involved and the grants available for putting trees in the ground. We will look at what has been achieved so far and the benefits the trees have brought to their whole business. Andrew, together with Till Hills forest ecologist John Gallagher, We'll also look at what it means to put the right tree in the right place at the right time and the planning processes involved in planting a new forest or woodland. Of course, woodland creation is a highly suitable option when it comes to providing companies with a means to help offset their residual carbon emissions. There really has never been a better time to plant trees. David McCulloch, Head of Carbon Store, a business stream of Till Hill, will be joining us at the end of the presentations to answer any carbon related questions you may have. The questions and answers will take place at the end, but do feel free to ask your questions on the Q&A function on screen during the presentations, and we will endeavour to answer them as best we can once we've heard all the presenters. Please remember, we are professional foresters and are not really known for our video creation skills. We plant trees for a living. Therefore, please forgive the quality of some of the video footage. And of course, it's quite hard to stop the wind blowing in Scotland. So, over to you, Callum. Thanks, Tim. Uh, good to be with everybody this morning. Um, as Tim suggested, we'll try and give you some introduction to a site we've been working on. Uh, indeed, the site's actually uh, being planted as we speak this morning. What we want to show you is a bit about how the right farmland, generally that difficult to work marginal ground, uh, which is not really working at its best in agriculture, can be repurposed for really good woodland creation. The project will have a look at 
first is is of a bigger scale, but there's a lot here that's transferable to any field of any size on those farms. The site was uh, acquired in 2018, April 2018, by its new owners, and we then spent the next 12 months working through planning detail and getting approval for, for grants to um, see the first trees growing in the ground around this time last year. This year, this planting season, the programme's really ramped up with Laurie loads of trees arriving every few days at the moment, and that's since we got clear of the snow and frost a few weeks back. The project will see a, a predominantly commercial conifer uh, woodland created, but with every commercial woodland, there's an element of diverse conifers and native woodland planted as well, so there's good diversity there. So we'll go over to the northeast of Scotland where you'll see more of me and also meet our senior forester for the site, David Hardy, who's nearly 30 years experience uh, in creating and managing woodlands. And between us, David and myself have seen this through the scheme through from helping the client with the initial land purchase, right the way through to um, the largely planted woodland that we've got today. in Aberdeenshire, a beautiful spring day, it's, uh, some, it's very difficult to believe it, this site had minus 12 only a couple of weeks ago, but you know, thank goodness we're coming into, going into spring now, the, fr the frost is just coming out of the ground in these fields, so the site itself is, is actually quite a tricky one because it's, uh, the soils are very clay based on old red sandstone, they're very difficult to work, and this area has a reputation locally of being a real tricky place to make a living on because you know if, if you don't get in and work the soils when they're in the right conditions you, you have major problems and that's part of the reason why this uh, the state who used to own this uh, this land sold it uh, to put it under trees uh, because it's a very farmers know it locally as a very difficult place to make a living well, that's that's how we came by it it, uh, it really wasn't working for, for farming them not as far as we understand it, so talking to the local estate owner, it's, um, it was definitely marginal um, marginal land. And that, that's the thing that's surprising, as you drive around, it all looks very rich and uh, productive, but you know, conditions are, uh, are, are tricky to say the least. And as, as far as we're concerned, you know, it's very low in nutrients. Um, you know, it, it looks like it should be a very simple, straightforward process to come and plant trees and then they'll just you just walk away, but it's it's never that. It's never that it's so it must be quite. It must be quite high input then. It's farming. Yes, I mean, if you if say farmers are very good at what they do, and, you know, by the time they you know they plough it, harrow it, roll it, seed it, you know, they come back and then they spray numerous uh, chemicals, and then at the end they spray glyphosate, which has been a bit of a problem for us because right. spraying off the crop at the end, they've killed everything because we would have liked to have had some some biological activity in the soil, which would have helped us. Mm -hmm. The previous owner said that it, it was a fairly rare year that we actually made a reasonable profit off, off of this ground. Yeah, and I can understand it. We, we've been learning the hard way why, <laughs> why it is the case on this site. You know, as I say, you, you, if, you, if you get a window of opportunity, you really have to, have to jump on it. Yeah. As you can see here, we've, uh, we've started this at the beginning of the week. Um, we've been planting over in some grass over there, which, which is working out okay, but we've come here. Uh, and the, the planting machine uh, went down the hill, it got to the bottom and it got stuck. So we had to, uh, to go off for a few days to dry it. Yeah, you can really see the, see the clay in that. Yeah, so Dave, as we can see, I mean, I, I, that's not nice stuff to be working with as a farmer. That, you know, you've got a very limited year if this starts to get, to get wet, doesn't it? And for us, that's been really hard work as well. It's, it's, it's great, I mean, it's, it's fertile. It's, yeah. It's got, nutrition in it but it's just the working characteristics that we're, we, we do struggle with as as the farmers have. The trees will be very happy in this. Oh perfect I mean you can just yeah. look around I mean you have you see the young trees there the leaders yeah. on those I mean they're, they're, they love it and the, the shelter belts round about it it'll grow trees there's no doubt about that. Mm. So. so what do we do here Dave in terms of ground prep to get the trees in the ground? What are our options? And 
well, I mean, there's, there's, there's many options to prepare the ground for, for trees, but in, in this case, we decided to go with a local contractor, Wendy Straw. We've been planting trees on the fields where he's planting for literally decades. Uh, so it's a tried and tested uh, technique and method to make it work. So it's all, and it's very cost effective. So we, we, we went with that system. Uh, as you can see, uh, the trees here are, are doing well. Yeah, they're looking, looking quite nice. I mean, Gone in nice and straight and uh, put on a good good bit of growth in the first first week while they were in. Yeah, yeah. And, and when these were planted, it was very dry, it was very difficult conditions, but uh, you know the, the trees have grown through it and have thrived. So excellent. Yeah. Good result. So tell us a bit more about the plant machine and, and, and what it's doing. Well, it's a, it's a very uh, essentially a very simple machine. Uh, if you have two operators sitting on bays at the back, feeding trees into rotating arms, which are being fed into a, a plough furrow, which is then closed up by two wheels. It's very simple, uh, a bit of an art tip, but it's high production, high output, you know, 15 to 18,000 trees a day, you know, so it's cost effective. Ideal. So these are uh, uh, sinker spruce, uh, vegetatively propagated. Um, so they've, they've come from uh, families that have exhibited uh, superior growth characteristics of, you know, rates of growth, density, uh, branching habit. Uh, these come from uh, Mela, Mela nurseries. Um, so, you know, we're hopeful that the yield classes, the growth rates, are going to be quite a bit higher than the, the spruce that you see around about, which are growing perfectly well, but these should grow a lot faster. Uh, and have better growth characteristics for you know, timber production. So, uh, as you can see, they, but they do have a, a bit of a wiggly growth habit, which is uh, characteristic of the, the juvenile trees. They do, but they grow out and uh, look much better and straighter later on. Yeah, so that straightens up very, very quickly. It does, yeah, a yeah. Couple, of, couple of years of growth. And in fact, even after the first, if they get a good first season of growth, then, you know, they, they look fine. Not bad roots on them as well, which uh, used to used to, it was a, a bit of an issue with vegetative pro propagated spruce trees that uh, the, root, the rooting wasn't great, but the tree breeding is really uh, paying off now. So, uh, and that's uh, fair play. That's you know up to up to Mela or down to Mela. Good quality trees. Good quality trees. Yeah. So I'll get these planted and uh, hopefully we'll have a good growing season. So we moved to the south end of the site here, Dave, and obviously we've done something different here. What, what's the, been the method here? Well, we've used a continuous acting mounder here, uh, spiral mounder, uh, basically because the swab, the grass swab was so dense that the planting machine wouldn't have been able to plant through it. So mounding was a, a better option on this site. Um, so we've got this area we planted broadleaves and tubes, uh, which is part of the, the riparian zone. Uh, through time, we'll have trees uh, growing up here close to the water, and it's just it's good environmental. Uh, environmentally, it, it introduces greater diversity into the into the environment for, for wildlife biodiversity. And we've done that all the way down uh, the side of the farm from the, the farm is actually the the eastern boundary of the property. So we've repeated that all the way down the bottom uh, in groups of broad leaves. So a brief insight there into one of our new woodland creations up in the northeast and some of the processes that we're using to get trees in the ground as well as a, a little look at what we're planting. Schemes like the one we've just seen are supported by a good package of grants from Scottish Forestry. But I suppose one of the key questions is how much does it cost to get something like this planted? Well, that's actually a very individual thing. And we need to consider things like the cost of getting the application approved. And that can in some cases need a lot of data gathering depending on the site. But with our experience and discussion with the regulator, we can hopefully keep those costs at a minimum. Um, with what type of woodland is it that you're planting? Is it broadleaves? Is it conifer? Um, different trees, different treatments, obviously cost different amounts. What initial site type are we starting with? 
Um, and what kind of preparation does the site need to get the trees the best start? We'll also need to consider the scale of the project, the maintenance of crop that will likely be in the first few years. So quite a few things to kind of build that, build that picture. In all these elements, we've got access to a wide range of quality suppliers and contractors. So not only can we make sure that you get the best quality of scheme, but we can make sure that the prices are competitive too. And at the very outset, what we'll do for you is that we'll come and we'll assess your land, um, give you some ideas as to what can be done with it, build you up a cash flow estimate that will set out the key costs and incomes for your particular situation. And I suppose there's a little bit of summary. Uh, the grants can pay for all of the planting and establishment, and they're kind of, the project scale is big enough, be a, a good healthy surface which you could you know, potentially reinvest elsewhere. It's worth also noting knowing that if the land has current uh, entitlement um, you can still claim basic farm payments on planted land so that gives you some interim income while the trees are going to produce that first timber and beyond that there's also things like woodland carbon funding and that's there as a, as a topic for schemes that financially might be a bit more marginal there's a ready demand for purchase of carbon units which woodland schemes will create, and the owner, once those schemes have uh, been audited and the potential credits allocated, can sell these on to buyers for good sums of money. How many carbon units a woodland will generate depends again on the potential growth rate of trees, the species type, management scheme, and a variety of other factors. But for a site like the one we just looked at, where we can forecast fairly fast growth rate, the intention to thin the crop and clear for it around 40, 45 years, we could be seeing 140 carbon units per hectare. And that could be easily see an extra £1,500 per hectare income for the landowner over and above grants. Were we to be looking at a native broadleaf woodland, inevitably on some very different ground, we could be looking at potentially 600 units per hectare. But that's likely to be you know, something quite different, and uh, there'll not be the timber income from that type of scheme. Uh, so you know, the, the carbon can make up for that. What we're very much looking at with woodland owners at the moment is how to balance the potential income from carbon with a future income from timber and potentially looking at the wider opportunities from, from, from natural capital. And I suppose with the timber income, you know, likely to continue to increase, one would usually expect timber prices to remain strong over the longer term, although definitely there's some, some dips and peaks along the way. And carbon, price, carbon prices, the market suggests, will equally increase for the foreseeable future. So anyone creating a new woodland really needs to take a rounded view on how these different types of income and when they might come in will work best for them. And of course, how that fits with the wider objectives they might have for creating a new woodland. And of course, we really do think that getting good professional health and advice is essential to help you look at all the options. Because there's nearly all, always a variety of woodland creations or creation options for any piece of ground. And you kind of want to really think through, through all of those. And finally, just I want to take a moment to consider some of the other benefits of new woodland. Even a more commercial development like the one we've just looked at will bring a wide range of other benefits to the landscape. Over the early years, you'll never see, inevitably see uh, small mammal populations increase on the site. And you know, that will bring uh, more raptors that are attracted to that prey. And as the woodland grows and habitats change, inevitably you'll see you know, a wide range of different birds and mammals that will use it. I think it's worth saying there's, there's a bit of a myth that commercial forests are devoid of life. Well, I walk in a maturing commercial forest every morning and I can assure you, it's a bit of a joy at the moment. It's full of bird song and other life just now. And finally, you know, possibly thinking about, you know, some things like the open rides and in the future the forest roads, they'll bring in another interesting species. People um, like me who want to use the forest for recreation. So every forest is a multi-benefit woodland and, and really what's not to like about that. So thanks for listening. Um, I hope I'll be talking directly to some of you soon uh, about how we can help you create your new woodland. Uh, but for now, with that, I'm going to put you back over to Tim.
Hey, thanks for that, Callum. Um, just noticing we haven't got any questions yet, so uh, please do submit them on the Q&A function um, to uh, get us off ground. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now hear our second speaker, Andrew Vaughan. Uh, Andrew is Till Hill's regional manager for North Scotland, having graduated from Aberdeen in 1986 and has been responsible for planting well over 30 million trees for woodland creation projects in his career to date. Uh, he joined Till Hill in 2004 with a very broad range of experience, making him ideally suited to manage all aspects of the client properties overseeing uh, creation projects. Andrew is a fellow and council member of the Institute of Chartered Foresters and is a member of Scottish Forestry Grant Scheme Customer Reps Group. So with that I'll pass you over to Andrew. Thank you Tim and uh, good morning everybody. Um, today I'll be sharing a case study of a woodland creation project that we've been involved with at a farm called West of Gatherleys, which is uh, situated near Perth in central Scotland. And to set the scene, we should first consider why landowners might choose to plant new woodlands. As Callum mentioned in the previous presentation, each forest has the ability to contribute different benefits, some economic, some environmental and some societal, whilst generating direct economic value and many often intangible benefits. By their nature, trees will sequestrate carbon as they grow, which with productive species will generate a valuable timber resource. The woodland or forest provides other benefits, some directly to the owner, some for others to appreciate and enjoy, and some for wider society. The owner may have particular aims and objectives, but the very fact that a woodland consists of a four dimensional habitat means that it will deliver multiple objectives. And this diagram gives an indication of how these benefits can interact from providing a single purpose to wider societal benefits. For this case study, West the Gatherleys promotes timber production as well as bespoke habitat improvements and ecosystem services, whilst offering better access opportunities to the owners and wider landscape scale benefits to the local area. Thus, the blue star indicates where the project is considered to sit in delivering these multiple objectives. Even our most commercially minded clients quickly begin to appreciate that every forest or woodland provides habitat to a multitude of species, often with at least one designated or rare species and frequently more. Scotland has many varied but important heritage assets and it is our duty to ensure we protect and, where possible, to enhance them. But when planning a new forest or woodland, we have to consider the wider impact at a landscape scale, including consideration of all natural heritage resources, be it native or non-native woodland, other semi-natural habitats, or areas managed at low intensity, which together favour our native wildlife. So for example, the left-hand box represents a landscape with a random 10% cover of more favourable wildlife habitats. They're poorly connected, they've no significant core areas, thus they would tend to favour small populations of isolated specialist species and some generalist species. It's only when we approach 50% cover that habitats develop stronger links that will best support our most generalist species and the more significant core areas or nodes are still infrequent and they may still limit opportunities for particular specialist species. At 60% cover, the nodes aggregate into significant and more robust core areas, which generally favor and maximize opportunities for both specialist and generalist species. Thus, this concept underpins the Scottish government's ambitions to increase the extent of both native and non-native woodland cover in association with protecting and ideally promoting other semi-natural habitats to counter the climate and biological emergencies. The right tree in the right place for the right purpose. Going back to our case study, um, 
as I said, it's for a farm woodland creation project at West de Farm near Perth in central Scotland. Our clients are John and Shona Patterson, with the boundary of the farm shown on the right-hand map. The site has a northerly aspect prominent on the north face of the Oakle Hills and lies at the edge of the larger Dunning Forest complex. The initial design concept and costing was completed in August 2017. The grant application was then approved by February 2018 and the owner completed the fencing and some of the cultivation with the balance of the cultivation completed in March 2018 and the planting then finished in April 2018. And you may recall that coincided with the beast from the east, so it wasn't particularly easy weather-wise for us. Now, in consideration of the uh, owner's objectives, you can see uh, on the aerial photo map, uh, the farm consists of 96 hectares uh, um, of better in-by fields around the farm buildings, but also rough grazing for cattle and sheep. Some 50 hectares of the property was either very exposed, partly steep, had poor access or was considered unproductive for farming. So the objectives we were set were to improve productivity of the property, improve the shelter value, improve the fencing, improve the access within the property, improve its capital value, grow timber to sequestrate carbon, and perhaps more importantly for the family living there was to improve the utility and enjoyment of, of the site. Understanding and resolving the site constraints uh, while securing the owner's objectives is fundamental to achieving a good design. Unknowns at the outset included breeding birds, vegetation, priority habitats, protected species, what soils were present, whether there was any deep peat, and if, whether there was any archaeology on site. So we use our experience and discussion with our client um, to allow us to consider the functional use and integration of the proposed design into the farm business. The process for obtaining permission to plant the woodland and to secure funding through the forestry grant scheme uh, in Scotland starts with the owner's objectives and as I've just described. We then go through a process of due diligence to understand the site constraints and the most significant aspects are then recorded in an issues log as we engage and consult with stakeholders, including neighbours. Once resolved, a draft design is submitted to the regulator, Scottish Forestry, who check that the proposed design is compliant with the UK forest standard. And once the final design is agreed, the application goes on the public register for 28 days following which a contract is issued and work can then begin on site. Um, I now have a, a short video um, from John Gallagher, the Till Hill senior ecologist, who will explain a bit more about the due diligence process. What are the things that potential woodland owners or uh, people wanting to plant woodlands need to think about uh, from an ecological perspective? A number of things they have to think about. On any scale of woodland, they need to think about the need for various surveys, and those surveys might probably be breeding bird surveys, vegetation surveys, and protected species surveys. We get uh, those those done, uh, the key one really in terms of timescales is the bird survey. That needs to be done between uh, April and, and, and June, uh, three, probably a minimum of three visits. For quite some time, so with the creation projects, the sort of thing you're, you're seeing around the venue just now, the surveys we would recommend and probably be re required to do by the regulators would be uh, breeding bird survey, uh, soils and deep peat, uh, archaeological surveys, and landscape, some sort of landscape and visual impact assessment, uh, so that we fully understand the site and its, and its sensitivities. This land we're standing in now is, is typical of where we find lots of woodland creation projects and we call it margin below ground. The land we're standing in here is there's, there's a lot of wall activity. There are resurgence, resurgence in the wildlife and we will find shoggy hills here, pestrels here. Uh, on some sites we will we'll, we'll find uh, other, other senses uh, utilising the, the ground with, with the, uh, the vegetation we're coming from. The key thing in, in any of design, uh, even in uh, productive schemes, uh, is the range of species. As an ecologist, broadleaves uh, do, do it for me. And Andrew, if you look behind you, 
uh, the, uh, the time on the north side as, as, as a decent species mix. And if we look above us, we're looking at uh, the, what we call the riparian zone, and you can see you know, the, 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 the clearly buffer, clearly buffer to protect the water resources coming off the site. Again, that, that's key for us, key for us in any woodland creation scheme. So John, can I ask you about the, the ecological impact of having to use plastic uh, in woodland creation? In this example here, we have protective tubes uh, that are protecting the trees from browsing damage, but it, it, is this a particular concern and issue and what should we be doing about it? But I think the plastic is, is, is doing its job, it's getting these trees established, but uh, you know, we, we know the, uh, the issues surrounding plastic that have been raised over the, the last while. And uh, as, as a company, we're looking to uh, find alternatives to plastic. Uh, biodegradable products don't have the same uh, poor environmental footprint as, as tubes. All woodland creation projects, like the one we're standing in, Andrew, uh, have to meet the uh, UK forest standard. That means uh, certain things, and one of the things it means is uh, achieving a, a species mix within the woodland. This scheme will predominate on sitka spruce. As you'll see behind me, uh, there will be large areas of broadleaves uh, and pine further in the background. So you know it's not a one-trick pony in terms of species. It, it's, it's as wide a range as possible, uh, and of course it also depends on the owner's objectives in terms of what the species mix is. Uh, and we do large commercial schemes, and we also do large uh, native woodland schemes. It really depends on you know what the objectives of the, the owner are in, in these projects. There is, a, there is a stage before we do anything, which is what we call due diligence. Uh, that may involve a site visit, preferably it involves a site visit by my, my, myself and the, the forestry team. But it also involves uh, get, uh, historic information on the site, which is held online. That may be aerial photographs, it may be something called the National Biodiversity Network. It could be uh, archaeological databases. Soils databases. It gives us a picture of the site. Uh, even if we can't have a site visit, it will give us a picture of the site and its sensitivities. Now, if a site is sensitive in relation to perhaps statutory nature conservation designations, we will advise that uh, or advise the client not not to pursue a, a, a particular woodland creation if, if, it, if it's so sensitive. So really, that's essentially the due diligence process, which really is the start of the, the, the whole woodland creation thing. We're standing in a, a new woodland creation scheme that was planted uh, in 2020. Uh, I was involved in the, the, some of the surveys, the, the vegetation survey in particular. And as a, as a bit of land that comes up, this, this, was, this was fairly easy in terms of getting it through the system. Uh, essentially because we're, we're dealing with, as you can see in the, the background here, we're dealing with uh, improved grassland, semi-improved grassland. Uh, it's had long inputs of uh, agricultural improvement. You know, it's good for trees as well uh, because there's good soil fertility there. So we'd expect a, a, a rapid establishment and a higher crop on, on this side. So with regards to West of Galilee's, the key constraints for the project are, are shown uh, on the two maps here. The map on the left shows the soils. Um, and these dictate the tree species options and the cultivation requirements for the site. Um, the site was found to have poor and thin soils on the upper slopes, fertile and freely draining on the intermediate slopes, uh, and pockets of wet, heavy soils in the hollows. And these had to be treated differently in terms of how we prepared the ground and, and drained them. Um, and the map on the right shows the vegetation, um, which consisted mainly of unimproved acid grassland with clumps of gorse, uh, marshy grassland in the lower lying hollows, dry heath with heather on the upper slopes, and pockets of neutral grassland and wet flushes along the riparian corridors. Possibly the, the most prominent issue to be uh, considered uh, here was the breeding birds. So these were surveyed and we recorded 170 individuals with 71 breeding pairs. And the ecologist who conducted the survey uh, considered that the proposed planting would overall have a, a predictive impact of low magnitude of only local significance. Uh, and from the table, you can see if the, the species affected with the proposed planting areas, the impact would be on skylark and meadow pipits. Uh, and he considered that they would be easily displaced to the adjacent similar habitats, so the population would be sustained. 
and the proposed design would provide mitigation. Uh, use of undisturbed riparian habitats by diverse species of birds, uh, creation of a more diverse structural habitat to the larger Dunning forest above, um, retention of scrub along the unplanted edges, and better habitat connectivity uh, would be used by the likes of Skylark and, and Curlew going forward. With regards to tree species, um, we use the, the forest research decision support tool called ESC. Uh, which stands for ecological site classification. Uh, and we use this to assess the key environmental characteristics of the site and the likely impact uh, on a, a wide range of tree species. And in our example here, uh, the site is relatively exposed. Uh, the red circle at the top there shows that the dam score, which is the exposure sort of rating of the site is high at about 15. And it's a north facing slope. So therefore, it doesn't get much sun and, and the accumulated temperature is, is probably the key factor that will limit choice of species. So from the table below, you can see uh, our chosen productive timber species are Sitka spruce, which uh, is predicted to grow at yield class 17, and Scots pine predicted to grow at yield class 9. Um, and these are above, uh, both above uh, average growth rates. And um, the model also allows us to consider the impact of climate change and, and changing climate and, and are the species still tolerant of that? And in this case, they were. The final approved woodland design is shown on, on the aerial photo here on the right. And we achieve grant funding of four hectares to, to remove gorse. Um, we have 50 hectares as a conifer model, and that comprises 33 hectares of improved uh, full sibling Sitka spruce. So this is the, uh, the sort of top genetics for tree growth. Uh, we also have seven hectares of larch and Scots pine as other conifers to diversify the edges, uh, five hectares of native broadleaves and five hectares of designed open ground. It also included funding for two and a half thousand meters of new stock fencing with five gates. And we also uh, received funding of, for 1,200 metres of new roading uh, and a turning area under the Sheep and Trees Initiative. And it, if you consider kind of the proposed design, you know, we're rationalising the fencing. We're creating the shelter around the in-by fields, around the, the, the farmhouse and the farm buildings. We're protecting the water supply, both to the farmhouse and to uh, the, the burn that goes off down the hill. Um, it will create improved and safer access to the hill above. And we have a, uh, the productive species which will provide the timber, carbon sequestration and a sort of appreciating capital value, which the owners were seeking. And I think most importantly to the owners, um, utility, use, usefulness of the site. Um, they created a, a, a small pony trekking ride and they've got the track as well that they can use. Uh, they have a pond and they've created a, a family barbecue site there close to the farmhouse. Um, and longer term, we've got the network of, of habitat there, which will promote more bird life. Uh, and probably most importantly for the farm, the long-term shelter for the fields uh, around the, the, the house and the farmstead for, for lambing. In respect of carbon, um, Till Hill, um, We've worked with a PhD student to develop a model that has been peer reviewed by forest research to accurately predict carbon emissions and sequestration for any particular woodland, woodland creation project. The aim is to allow our forest managers to impartially compare different establishment scenarios and strategies and to pick the optimum solution that's compliant with our client's objectives. With inputs of species, area, stocking density, soil parameters, cultivation technique, protection measures, whether we're using plastic, um, fencing and maintenance needs, the model accurately, accurately predicts the early emissions, ongoing sequestration rates, and the year to net zero. So the West of Galilee's project will generate initial emissions peaking at 326 tonnes of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent 10 years after planting. And as the trees begin to grow, they'll achieve net zero by year 14. Uh, and then over the typical rotation length of 50 years, we'll achieve a net accumulation of 5,200 tonnes of carbon uh, dioxide over that period. 
But rather than me uh, explaining a lot about what we've done, we thought we'd uh, include an interview with our clients so you could uh, hear from them directly. So this is uh, John and Shona Patterson who will be joining us now. Hey, good morning, John and Shona. Um, could you tell us something about West of Gatherleys as a property and a farm? It's a hill farm and rock raising, cattle and sheep. Um, came up here 20 years ago looking for something different and had a blank canvas to start with and created something, which is what you see here. Can you tell us why you were interested in uh, woodland creation? So shelter would have been uh, or it will be helpful. Um, some of the a lot, some of the land was very rough, difficult to accept, uh, access for squad bikes and, and for moving livestock around. Um, so it wasn't really particularly productive or, or even helpful. Um, so it was just an opportunity to create investment for the future and also to take out some of the awkward bits in the, the current business. Can you explain a bit uh, about how Tillhill helped you with this process? Uh, yes, um, the grant scheme uh, was complicated and uh, difficult for someone who's not uh, doing that every day. So Tillhill basically applied for all the permissions and did all the surveys and prepared everything for us and talked through all the, the potential opportunities that we mm -hmm. had with the land, helped design the scheme, which is, is far better than, than I could have imagined um, when, we, when we first looked at the idea ourselves and guided us through the entire process. Um, their support regarding timescales and everything has just been invaluable. We couldn't have done this on our own. And, and John, in, in this particular project, you, you did elements of the work yourself. Can, can you explain about uh, what you were uh, responsible for dealing with? Well, from the start, um, with the guidance of yourselves at Till Hill, it was ground preparation for planting, um, so clearance of scrub, gorse, and anything else that needed taken out of the way, uh, and also mounding in areas that were probably too wet for the tractors to go uh, for ploughing, so I was able to do that, but also the fencing, um, sourcing the materials uh, and doing the fencing myself um, to keep costs down and get the fencing the way we wanted it and where we wanted it. Um, certainly was a big advantage. So another interesting aspect of this project is that you receive funding through the Sheep and Trees Initiative for uh, installing roading for future timber access. Yeah, well, it was very simple, the fact that we were given the opportunity to put the road in now, it seemed silly not to. Uh, it gave us much better access to the hill and our ground, which before was not the best, but we can now access the top of the hill all the time. But also for our recreation side of things. Can I ask you about the financials then uh, for this project? Um, how have they worked out for you with the costs and the grants? The, the grants obviously paid after the work was done, which, which was a bit of concern. But um, yeah, it, it has worked out well and we're pleased with it. So as part of this project, um, you've also been doing the maintenance of the trees um, yourselves to get them established. Can you say a bit about the work that's, that, that's entailed? So it has to be done um, every, every season. We, we have been lucky in that Till Hill have said that they will come back and help us with that if we if we can't manage it to the appropriate standard ourselves. Um, but yes, it is it is an important part of the project that can't be just left aside. And is that a big commitment? It is a commitment in the winter when particularly when the weather's not great. It's what, what three tips would you give to prospective landowners uh, wishing to plant trees? Professional advice all the way through the whole process is absolutely essential. Um, it certainly saves an awful lot of time, money, and heartache having guidance uh, from Till Hill all the way through. And if you're looking for another source for diversification, it's a very good one. Uh, it's shown said, especially with the, the professional advice that goes with it. And it's a long term investment for, for the family, um, which we can enjoy as it goes. Shona, can you tell me something about the ecology of the woodland area that we've planted? Has it changed? Well, most definitely. The fact that the bird life has increased tenfold, but not just in the areas planted, but they're coming in the corridors 
in between each area that's planted and the bird song because they can flip back and forth is great. Yeah. Well, much better than it was before. Great variety of birds, um, lots of skylarks. Currently, we're, we're more of them than we had before, definitely. And if I uh, was pointed out, red kite. Mm -hmm. We have red kite over us now. Um, not everybody likes them, but we do. <laughs> so, um, to summarise then, the, the capital grants for planting, fencing and roading, plus five years of maintenance grants, will generate a surplus, not least because John and Sean have committed to undertake aspects of the work themselves. And with regards to carbon funding, the rates offered back in 2018 were not judged adequate to offset the potential downsides, which at that point in time were considered to be loss of autonomy, loss of control in terms of how the, the, the uh, forest could be managed and protection of their privacy. In conclusion, uh, West of Galilee's has been an interesting project with enthusiastic uh, and committed clients who unusually have been willing to undertake several aspects of the site work themselves to maximize their return from the grants, whilst listening to and following the advice offered to secure the establishment of the woodland. I think this is a, a good model for future clients to benefit from woodland creation grants and shows that we at Till Hill are flexible and will adapt to the needs and work together to achieve their objectives. Uh, I shall now return you to our chairman, Tim Lydon, who will offer some concluding remarks and lead the Q&A session. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we're now at the stage where we've got some questions. So if Callum, Andrew, David and John, can I ask you all to make sure your videos and mics are turned on. Now, for the first, <clears throat> first question, um, what is the relationship between size of site and economic return from said site? Is there a minimum economic scale? Andrew, perhaps you would like to pick that one up? Um. Well, it depends. I mean, the, the smaller sites uh, tend to be more intricate, but they, they, they can offer more um, intangible benefits. And, and if you value those and the sort of societal benefits, they, they can be important. In terms of just pure capital and, and, and sort of future income, you need probably a minimum of 10 hectares um, to justify sort of scale of, of for timber production, putting the roads in, etc. Um, but like I said, if you had 10 hectares scattered in shelter belts and so on that provided other benefits, then you, you, you know the, the ecosystem services benefits would be well in excess of what the timber uh, value would be. Um, but yes, yeah, so around about 10 hectares, I would suggest, is, is, is the minimum if, if you're looking at productive uh, timber. Okay, thank you for that. Um, second question, uh, how does tilling and preparing ground impact on the soil carbon content. Perhaps that's another one for uh, Andrew and then David, if you wanted to pick up after that. So, Andrew. Well, we, we cultivate soils to, to um, assist the trees to, to establish in themselves. They need a narrated uh, dry planting position and creating sort of, a, well, cultivating the soil creates a mound which warms up more quickly. So we actually have a longer growing season. So the roots grow more quickly and for a longer period in the early years. And that then means we use less chemicals to establish the trees, you know, because they're, they're, they're in competition with weeds. So we have to strike a balance between just doing enough cultivation to um, con control the conditions around the tree to get them established but not too much that we're, we're disturbing too much soil and, and potentially releasing carbon. And certainly this is a topic of the moment. Um, this is one of the reasons why we've produced this carbon model to allow us to make uh, informed decisions and compare different techniques. Um, and certainly the, the cultivation guidance is, is as, I, as I speak, being reviewed for the, the carbon impact. And it's something we are treating very seriously because you know, our, our model calculates year to net zero. So it, it actually works out how much carbon we will release from the soil types and the cultivation technique to make sure that we're, we're not um, got a long term period between disturbing the soil, releasing carbon and then sequestrating it from the, uh, the tree cover. 
and that is vital. You know, we, we have our society is going to see big changes between now and 2045 with the climate change agenda coming through. And we have to, as an industry, we have to make sure that we're not um, uh, impacting on these, these uh, changes and targets. Thank you. Uh, David, any, any follow up on that? Um, I, I mean, to be honest, Andrew's given a pretty comprehensive answer. So, um, so no, nothing, nothing to add specifically on that. Okay, thank you. Um, right, next question. At what stage does the farmer advise the department uh, the change of use from agriculture to forestry to protect his IAX payments? Callum, is that one that you would pick up? Yeah, I mean, if you've got current entitlement, then as we put it through, uh, through the, the grant scheme, um, there'll be the element of consultation with the department anyway, but um, it would go through and it would just form part of your uh, normal annual claims um, for that basic payment um, subsidy. Um, so it's just a case of keeping everybody, keeping everybody in the loop, but it, it, getting a plan through is kind of fairly long term. Uh, it can take us to, you know, that 12 months, so continue to farm it uh, in that period. Uh, and, and then as I say, on your annual um, return, then you know, we'll still be claiming the basic payment there for you. I think it's worth saying as well, Tim, that uh, the online application system currently is set up. It's on the RPID system anyway, so uh, they automatically see it and they're consulted as well as a matter of course. But through the, the um, when you go on the, the public register, the, they're consulted as part of that process. So they are aware of what's coming through. Uh, and it's, so it's all done automatically, basically. Good. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, one for you, David, I think. Uh, how does CO2 per hectare translate into income? Um, so builders, um, sorry, Ian. Um, so you're basically looking at um, how many tonnes of, of um, carbon dioxide can I sequester per hectare? And that answer, that answer depends. Um, conifer plantations, which are being felled perhaps 40, 50 years, you're sequestering many fewer tons of carbon dioxide than perhaps for broadleaf plantations that you're letting uh, to stand for uh, 70, 80, 90 years. And the difference in that varies very roughly. Um, uh, Sitka spruce, you're looking at anywhere between 150 to 200 tons sequestered per hectare. And um, broadleaves, you're looking at um, closer to um, five to 600 tons per hectare. The second part to that is um, in terms of what prices you're earning uh, for the pending issuance units that you're, you're issued with upfront by the Woodland Carbon Code. And again, they do vary because of the needs and requirements that companies have when they're assessing the merits of certain schemes over others. And there is a price difference between, um, uh, between PIUs that are generated by um, uh, commercial um, forestry schemes versus, versus um, broadly schemes. And perhaps, you know, commercial schemes, you could look at 12 pounds per PIU and broadleaf schemes, you could be looking at perhaps 14 to 15 pounds per PIU. So, uh, you know, these are the variables you're looking at and, and on those figures alone, you know, depending on the scheme, you're looking at, at potential income ranging anywhere between, um, just doing the sums in my head, but about two and a half thousand pounds per hectare up to um, closer to six to seven thousand pounds per hectare. Okay, thank, thank you for that comprehensive answer. Um, what uh, would you be expecting the demand in carbon offsetting by planting broad leaves to become as good and investment opportunity as commercial forestry? I mean, to be honest, this one depends in entirely on what happens to the price of woodland carbon units. It's, 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 um, uh, it's a balancing act between um, 
you know, the price of timber and the price of uh, pending issuance units or, or um, uh, their kindred woodland carbon units. And, um, uh, uh, and so what happens in uh, whether one goes down or the other goes up will obviously um, have a bearing on, on, um, uh, on, how, on how you design your, your woodlands. Um, but the key thing to keep in mind is actually, you know, as I was explaining um, a moment ago, you do get less uh, income from your um, uh, conifer plantations, but you are spreading your sources of income uh, rather than putting all of your, um, just trying to think of the expression, all of your um, uh, uh, things in one basket, all of your eggs in one basket. Um, and and so that's 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 an important factor to, to keep in mind, basically. So I hope that answers the question, Benjamin. Okay, uh, thank you, David. Um, <clears throat> right, the next question for uh, Andrew: Is there an economic timber return from deciduous trees, either planted uh, or grown by natural regeneration, stroke rewilding? Uh, which is so much in vogue these days? Um, potentially there is, um, but you, you'd be looking at um, perhaps biofuel, wood fuel um, in, in the main. Um, if you're looking at the natural regeneration, then you're, you're probably looking at mainly birch. Um, uh, I mean, ash and, 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 and sycamore are also uh, opportunities from, of native woodland regeneration, but obviously there's ash dieback to contend with. Um, uh, in, in my experience, uh, uh, we, we've had equivalent returns to Sitka spruce from sycamore, um, from you know, good quality veneer logs. And roughly, um, if you have a sycamore woodland, um, roughly 10% of the logs you produce will be high quality veneer logs, which will sell, they'll command a far higher price than um, a, a spruce log, for example. So yeah, there are opportunities there, but the market is not yet well developed. Um, and you know, it, 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 it's still some way behind the genetics. Um, we have looked at improved birch uh, for timber quality and timber production, um, but it's still early days yet. Um, and the markets for, you know, the, the, the timber, um, you know, if anything, they've narrowed and reduced rather than uh, kept going. So, you know, the, the emphasis has been on, on conifer uh, timber production. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting challenge and, and, and certainly, you know, for example, in Fife, there's 20,000 hectares of undermanaged farm woodlands and, you know, there's a, crying, there's a market there crying out to be uh, developed and, and improved to, to help bring better returns to the owners and bring these woodlands under better management. Okay, thank you for that. Um, this, <laughs> the next question is, is not dissimilar. Um, if you wanted to start a woodland for strictly conservation and stroke real rewilding purposes, what's the best way to go about it? Types of trees, funding, grants, feasibility? Gosh, um, yeah, that's that, that there's a lot of uh, information or, or whatever in, in that sort of uh, list of questions. Um, I mean, basically, I, I think you've got to look at the, the nature of the, the, the site. Um, if you're going for rewilding, you've got to have parent seed trees either present on the site or in the vicinity so they seed into it. You've got to think then about deer, um, which will be browsing um, potentially on, on that edge. Um, you've also got to think about, you know, the, perhaps there's other habitat values to, to that particular land. And, and you know, it, is it right that it goes to, to woodland under succession? Um, you know, that, and these are all parts of the dynamic that are quite uh, tricky to resolve. Um, but yeah, so it, if rewilding um, with, with uh, natural regeneration, you know, you, you have to have the parent seed trees there to help and start that off. Uh, and if you don't have that, then you are looking at woodland creation. Um, and there's different ways you can do it. You can plant in clumps, um, you can plant in mixtures as well. Um, and bear in mind that this is the first kind of a, a step to putting woodland back on the site, because obviously it would have been woodland uh, after the ice age. And it, you know, it's going to take perhaps hundreds of years for that site then to sort itself out and, uh, and the, the, the sort of natural tree species and, and vegetation to resolve itself and, and kind of uh, um, settle down. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly we have clients who are interested in, in re rewilding projects and, and, you know, they're, they're quite exciting and interesting for us, uh, you know, technically from a professional point of view. Thank you for that, Andrew. 
Uh, we're now on to right, Callum. Uh, how do you mitigate the concerns that landowners may have about planting new woodland on current farmland regarding the current policy that <clears throat> once a piece of land is designated as woodland, you can't change it back? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it, it's a big decision to put uh, land into woodland in the first place. <coughs> Uh, because you, you are committed to pretty much keeping it there. There are some exceptional circumstances where you can, um, if you fell one piece of woodland, replant it somewhere, somewhere else on the land. But we need to have a look at uh, overall what the needs of, of society are you know, overall. And you look at the, uh, the amount of timber and woodland that, that we have in this country and how much we import. We, we you know, import the vast majority of our, our uses for that. So we do need more, more timber. Um, we also recognise that we need to uh, increase the, uh, the carbon sequestration to offset using elsewhere. So using the right piece of land um, to put it into forestry is a really good use of it. And it won't be that, that you know, necessarily that, that, that best piece of um, agricultural land, which is, in, which is in the grain crop or, um, you know, it, it is growing the best of grass and really working for a farm. It's all those marginal bits that there are lots of, um, like some of the ones we've shown you, that, that, that the balance can, can, can switch one way or another and moving it into woodland, as I say, you, you can provide a lot for the economy, for people, for the environment. Um, and those are the bits that we, we tend to focus on uh, and, and you know, it, it just strikes that right balance. Okay, thank you for that, Callum. Um, I think this question is going to uh, need a couple of our present presenters and panellists. Um, I'll read the whole question. How does the water table relate to the depth of carbon in the ground? What registries do you recommend and why? And how does one procure a buyer for offsets? So, uh, John Gallagher, could you talk about the uh, relation between water table and depth of carbon in the ground? I, I, I think I can, <laughs> Tim. Uh, you know, with, with, with high water tables, you're, you're going to be getting more organic matter. So if you think of uh, areas of high rainfall, uh, certainly more than 50 inches a year, on, on, on hill ground, uh, you'll be talking about blanket peats. So, you know, with, with, uh, you know, with, with high water tables, uh, you, you, you'll be getting the, the potential for peatland, peatland habitats. And we need to be very careful in terms of any woodland creation on, on, on peatland habitat. Uh, there, is a, there is a strict rule at the moment that uh, any peak depth over 50 centimetres is, is, is out with the scope of any new planting. Uh, and that, 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 uh, that rule of thumb is applied very rigorously by the, the regulator. Uh, so, you know, with, with, with higher water tables, we, we are talking about more organic matter. Uh, and you know, if you think of, if you go west into Argyle, uh, even, even under rushes, we could be getting areas of, of, of deep peat. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question, Tim, but there is a strong association with water table and peatland habitats. Okay, thank you, John. David, would you like to comment on what registries uh, do you recommend and how you procure a buyer for offer? Yeah, sure, Tim. Um, the, I mean, the, the the registry which the Woodland Carbon Code and the Peatland Code operate under um, is called the UK Land Carbon Registry. And that is the, um, um, uh, the recognised uh, registry uh, under which the schemes are registered and then, um, and then uh, to which any uh, Woodland Carbon Units or Peatland Carbon Units uh, would be issued um, to your project and it's all operated by IHS market um, the land carbon registry is recently the peatland carbon registry and the woodland carbon registry have recently been amalgamated so it now creates much easier process for buying or for buyers of offsets 
Um, just to answer your final question, Selina, Selina the, the process for procuring a buyer is very much uh, one of the services which we in Carbon Store um, can help you with. And, and I have to say, we've, we've got a number of uh, um, uh, buyers who are, who are actively looking for uh, uh, pending issuance units at the moment. So, um, so that aspect is, is, is the, you know, the demand side of the equation is definitely encouraging at the moment. Correct. Thanks, David. Uh, next one um, for Callum, uh, if you can just give a quick answer to this. Uh, on one slide, it said between 50 and 60 percent of establishing costs would be covered by the grants, but you then mentioned that there could be a surplus. Yeah, again, it depends a little bit on the scale of the project and what, um, what the project requires. So. For example, if you've got a lot of fencing, then that might be a bit more expensive. If you've got a, got a fairly easy site that you can get through the planning fairly straightforward, even a small site, a, you know, four or five hectare site with, with the carbon value in there as well, um, is something that you can see a surplus of. So it's very site dependent um, as, to, as to where the, the, the breaking point is. I say small sites can, can provide surplus. Sometimes even larger sites can actually work a little bit the other way, but there's other value to that, later value. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's an individual thing. Okay, uh, and the next question is issues around tree supply from nurseries has resulted in smaller trees being planted, uh, 10 to 15 centimetres rather than 30 to 40. What impacts is this going to have on the planting and establishment costs? Do you want to follow that up, Callum? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a result of um, some fairly difficult growing seasons. Um, and the trees and, and trees this year have been a little bit smaller than we would expect. Um, but actually, in some sites, that can work out if not too bad. Uh, small trees on on, uh, on some sites where the wind blows a wee bit, you can plant them in a bit of shelter, in a bit of shelter on the mound, and that, they'll actually take quite well there. So the route to top height balance can work okay. Um, better than sometimes the, the sort of the, the bigger sized trees. So. It, we try. What we're trying to do is to find the right, put the right trees on the on the right site where they'll have the best uh, survival chances. Uh, and so we don't we don't foresee that it should it should cause too much of a problem that that smaller tree size. And, and you know, hopefully, with with a more reasonable growing season, uh, we'll return back to the more normal size of trees that we've, we've been seeing going in. Okay, thank you, John. Um, if a proposed woodland area conflicts with protected species. Will this block an application, or will it be considered that the woodland could increase populations of other protected species? Yeah, I mean it's a it's a balance sheet, isn't it? I mean, in any woodland creation, some species will be displaced, and some will will be accrued, uh, and we need we need to look at that balance. Uh, you know, it's the species that are of concern are what we call the red listed species. So things like curlew, which was mentioned in, in uh, I think Andrew's presentation, you know, that, that that's a big issue. It's a species that's lost a lot of ground since 1995, 50% reduction in population. So the, the, there's these things to factor in, in any woodland creation scheme. We need to assess a site, we need to understand what's going on, uh, and we need to take uh, the regulators with us uh, because they will be coming from a, a different position where they might see in some areas uh, woodland creation a threat to uh, protected species. So you know we need that we need that ecological input. We need to understand the ecology of sites to take sites forward. Okay. In terms of Thank, you. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is uh, what problems do you anticipate in establishment on a former dairy farmland? Uh, we've seen first season losses of uh, between 40 and 45 percent for conifer. Uh, if, if I might just answer that quickly, I think uh, each site has its own characteristics uh, and also each site is um, probably unique in terms of well, whether you get uh, an, an, an equally well um, weed growth. And, and so on. So it's very difficult to comment on that. Uh, we should endeavour to uh, make success, but sometimes that doesn't happen for a variety of reasons. 
And uh, next question, uh, what would it, you say in currently the smallest viable plot for planting a carbon offset, David? Uh, sure, Tim. Um, Ron, the key point is, I mean, to answer your um, question in a nutshell, between 1.5 uh, to 2 hectares, um, the reason behind that is the, the Woodland Carbon Code has a lot of fixed costs to it, irrespective of the size of your project. Um, the process of registration um, uh, takes about an hour or an hour and a half's work. Then you've got uh, the validation. Um, now, the auditor's fees themselves, um, if you're registering it as an individual scheme, the auditor's fees can be uh, about £1,200. And then it's, it's six or seven hours' work to gather together all the documents for the for, for the project design um, uh, document, which is central to that validation process. Um, it is worth mentioning that because um, we uh, at Carbon Store in Till Hill, we're we're, we're uh, uh, processing a very large number of schemes. Um, we can make the most of. Uh, grouping those schemes and by grouping those schemes we reduce the auditors fees really quite significantly for validation um, I mean sort of from about 1200 per project down to um, approximately 600 per project and that's the case for the subsequent verifications as well um, so um, uh, so to come back and answer your question in a nutshell, it's about 1.5 to 2 hectares. Great. Thanks, David. Um, following a woodland grant plantation, is there an optimum loss emitted due to deer browsing, if unfenced? Ooh, Andrew, you like the deer? Um. Certainly, I mean, it, it, it's challenging with deer and, and particularly in Scotland, the, um, the £45 million funding that Scottish forestry spend on woodland creation, they're spending £10 million of that on deer fencing. And basically the, the, the regulators saying, well, you know, this is not really a fencing grant, it's for woodland creation. So they're, they're looking at this more carefully now and you really have to justify using, uh, you know, including deer fencing uh, in, in your, your uh, grant claims or grant applications. But in terms of um, what we try to achieve is, is below 5% leader browse. Um, it's not that the, the deer completely eat the tree to the ground. Uh, that, that happens only in very exceptional circumstances. But if, if you're getting more than 5% leader browse, then you're starting to get uh, forking and damage to the trees. Uh, and I guess also it depends on the species of deer. Roe deer, uh, the trees will tolerate a degree of roe deer uh, browse. Red deer, though, can really you know, munch your trees right down to ground level. Um, so, but yeah, but basically it, it's something we monitor we, when we plant a site, we, are, we look at the constraints, we, we try to understand the deer population and, and dynamics before we uh, do the design and, and try and defend against that, either with fencing or with appropriate control measures. And we're then looking at, um, you know, basically uh, deer culling only for a, a period of years till the trees are above browse height, and then we can ease off on the deer control and, and let the deer come in. Um, so yeah, it, it, it depends. But as I say, the, the target, I think the, the Scottish forestry expect there to be less than 10% leader browse, but we, we aim to get down to about 5% or below if we can. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, please could you add some details on maintenance obligations that were set out in the contract? Um, Callum, could you pick that up? Yeah. Um, essentially your contract will, will require you to have a woodland established at, at so five years old at a certain density. So it can be between um, 1,100 trees an hectare or to 2,500 trees an hectare for a conifer. And really what you're trying to do is to, to make sure that you, the trees that we planted at the start, we probably plant a few extra just to allow for a little bit lost, actually going to get to that, that kind of final level. So putting trees in the ground and leaving them is never a good thing because there will be weed competition, which we may need to manage. Um, Andrew talked a little bit about deer management there that we need to do to make sure the trees get away. Um, and, you know, there can be 
things like uh, tubes could kind of fall over if you put tubes of snakes on, so they need some maintenance. But it's really about giving the, the, the trees that, that two or three years beyond just putting them in the ground, giving them the best growing conditions to get them away and get them established. Um, and we build that into any kind of work we'll do for you. Um, it's never just about putting the trees in the ground and getting them, let them get on with it because you won't have a successful work with that. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, what kind of sites from a soil type and exposure point of view are unsuitable for forestry? Cameron, do you want to pick that up? Yeah, well, we're obviously not looking at uh, any kind of deep beach. We just don't, we don't plant on that. Um, there are some parts of the world where you know, we do see pretty much peat and rock and we're not going to get trees growing well there either. Um, Trees can be fairly hardy, and it can depend a little bit about what type of woodland that you is you're trying to create. So that element of sort of almost well wood we were talking about there, um, you know, there are there are grants available for planting woodlands in fairly extreme kind of situations to get a, a low level ground cover. But obviously, the better if you're looking for something more commercial, the better ground you're looking for. Some mineral soils really are you know, your ideal kind of soil types. Um, but we can plant you know, trees on, on, on some glaze soils with a bit of appropriate drainage. Um, there's a bit of soil modification that we do just to kind of you know, make sure we get the, the trees away. So in most places, there's, there's a tree for the, the site, but also there's an element of cost to kind of getting, getting, getting the trees away and again, you've got to look at each, each site on its, on its merits. Uh, and some we do, as, we, as, as I think John Gallagher said in the video, some will say it's just not worth, worth trying this one here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, carbon, can carbon offsetting income be combined with other income sources such as biodiversity offsetting? David? Um, purists would argue they can't. They would argue that you're either um, using the land in order to sequester carbon or you're using the land in order to um, enhance the biodiversity. And, um, and so there's an inherent sort of uh, contradiction if you're saying you're, um, or if you're trying to um, earn income from, from both. That's, that's um, the principle under, underlying that reasoning. In practice, um, the generation of um, uh, biodiversity credits is at a much earlier stage than the Woodland Carbon Code and um, generating woodland carbon uh, credits. And, um, and so there's more uh, discussion to be had on how you, um, how, whether you can and, and, and um, uh, uh, combine those two markets. So, not a very comprehensive answer, but um, uh, but I think it's worth watching that whole space very closely to see how the carbon markets and um, the biodiversity markets uh, can work together, and for that matter, whether they do end up working together. I hope they do, for what it's worth. Thank, thank you. I'm, I'm sure we will see. So I was just going to add to that. So it's probably worth reflecting that in the carbon price uh, that. That you get, you will actually see some reflection of all the other biodiversity benefits that, that you get with, with a site. So while buyers are looking at, at, you know, some buyers are looking at purely just the carbon, a lot of, uh, of buyers really want to see that added biodiversity benefit on a site as well. And that, that can reflect in the price. So actually, you know, you are getting additional benefit the more you can offer uh, on the site as well. I think it's a case of uh, watch this case, isn't it? Yeah. Um, one question uh, going back, I think, to Andrew, your presentation, um, a participant um, missed what you said, carbon, rejected due to protection of privacy. Could you elaborate? Yes, well, I, I think what John and Shona were worried about was that if, if a company came along and bought their the carbon units that were being grown on West of Galilee's, that they would want to come and visit um, the, the, the woodland on a frequent basis. And 
um, and they just felt that that might lead to disturbance, which they wouldn't necessarily be in control of, perhaps at times when they're busy lambing or whatever, and, and they just felt unsure and, and, and a bit shaky about that. So their view was that, um, on balance, the, 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 the carbon funding wasn't for them. Okay, thank you very much. Um, more carbon for you, David. Uh, how is carbon offsetting income paid upfront or annually, or is it paid in future once established? Uh, funnily enough, actually, that leads quite well from the answer Andrew's just given, because, I mean, what we're trying to do in each case is, is, is um, uh, match a buyer of carbon units with a seller of carbon units. And, and woodland owners have different requirements and different needs. And, and that's as much the case for levels of privacy and, and levels of protecting privacy and the levels of access rights that they're willing and happy to give away as it is for, um, uh, for the way they, they derive the income from uh, their carbon offsetting. So we're very much trying to find a situation that works for uh, the landowner in question and put them in touch with the company so that the two interests match up basically. And in terms of uh, generating that income, um, the, I, I should say that, that, that mostly it is being done um, in terms of um, an upfront uh, payment, um, but, uh, uh, but again, if you would prefer to receive that payment in annual increments um, in subsequent years, depending on a, um, the establishment rate of the crop, um, or B, perhaps to keep your options open on, in terms of fluctuations in carbon prices, you know, that's a discussion that we had. I mean, basically the entire market for, for woodland carbon is at very, very early stages. And, um, and there's lots of needs and there's lots of uh, wishes. And, uh, and, and so we're, we're trying to um, uh, sort of find a process that reflect, reflects those differing needs and wishes from all the various parties in the market, basically. Okay, thank, thank you, um, David. Uh, next question is, how does Till Hill charge uh, landowners for their help? Uh, effectively, we would uh, discuss the project and discuss how we charge on, on, on that as an individual case comes up. Um, next one, these are the, the, we're getting quite tight for time, so there's will be two or three questions uh, to be answered now. Uh, who undertakes accreditation and verification of carbon savings for the Woodland Carbon Code? Yeah, so there's, there's uh, two organisations that are currently appointed by the Woodland Carbon Code as um, accredited bodies for validating and verifying um, your schemes. And it's Organic, Organic Farmers and Growers and the Soil Association. So, um, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Um, what have I gone to? I've just lost my, my, uh, my order here. Um, where have I gone? Right, is there an organic uh, certificate? Is there an organic certification for woodland creation? Andrew? Um, not specifically, but there is the UK Woodland Assurance Standard, um, which is kind of over and above the UK Forest Standard, which is, a, is environmental certification, which um, the owner would sign up to, um, to operate at that higher standard. So you're, you're operating a higher standard of certification than, than the UK Forest Standard would normally uh, re require you to. Um, but we don't have any sort of organic certification. But I suppose the, the UK Woodland Assurance Standard, um, ACWAS as it's called, is overseen by the Soil Association, who obviously are involved with organic certification. So that's probably the closest um, thing we have to that's similar to organic farming. Great. I'm going to take uh, two more questions. Uh, the next one is the penultimate one is what is the best way of lowering the time to net zero? Who would like to answer that? 
Uh, I can answer that, Tim, because um, we, with the model we have, we've looked at this and uh, from the PhD student um, who, who did it, we discussed it. And basically the, the best way to do it is to uh, plant trees on ground which has previously been cultivated because the carbon has already kind of been released from the soil or the natural carbon in it. Uh, and therefore the cultivation we do is, is really not changing it very much at all. And we can get down to um, time to net zero of five years. Okay. Thank you very much. So the uh, the last question, again for yourself, Andrew, who is setting the tilling soil carbon standards? Um, well, what we're doing is we, we um, in, in Scotland, certainly, we, we have a, a customer representatives group which deals with the forestry grant scheme. And that's made up of a wide list of stakeholders, including likes of S Scottish or Nature Scott, RSPB, etc., and um, also uh, members of the industry. And it is our job to come up with the guidance for um, cultivation standards. And so we're working with forest research to, to get based on sort of uh, uh, research data uh, to come up with the standards um, of, of how we're going to take this forward. So we're, we're currently working on version five of, of the standard. Um, so we've you know, been working on this now for three years. Um, so we're chipping away at it basically, and uh, we, we hope that we'll have something to publish uh, relatively soon. Thank you very much for that, Andrew. That's the last question. So um, our presenters today have given us a, a, an insight and a better understanding of how the wooden creation process works, what to consider, and how many benefits the plants can bring. Over the years, Till Hill has planted over a billion trees, and we do this as a living, uh, and we know what we're doing, and we want you to benefit from that experience. Thank you for listening and your questions. Uh, we will further we will answer any further questions personally in due course. And the recording of this webinar will be sent out to all participants. Do get in touch with us <coughs> for further information on anything you've heard today. Stay safe and goodbye. <laughs>